Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our monthly regulatory insight series. For this month, we are focusing on energy derivatives. I would like to give the floor to Shweta Ravi Kumar, the Executive Director of FSR Global, to make the opening remarks. Thank you, Maheli. A very warm welcome to all our participants and speakers. Uh, today's topic is uh, a relatively new and exciting topic uh, in the context of Indian power market discussions. Uh, so we're super happy to have a, a, a very nice uh, set of speakers. We have Alejandro who's coming in uh, with the international, particularly the US perspective of how uh, things have emerged on electricity derivatives in particular there. Then we have uh, Professor Ajay Pandey, who has uh, been leading some of these discussions uh, coming in from IIM Ahmedabad, who will talk about what are the implications of introducing electricity derivatives in the case of India. And then we will have uh, reactions from the different trading uh, platforms. We have uh, the IEX Power Exchange represented by Mr. Rohit Bajaj. Then we have Ms. Ruchi Shukla from uh, MCX, uh, who's the Commodities Exchange. And then we have Mr. Rajesh Cheryal uh, from the PTC uh, group. So we will uh, see how the different stakeholders have to interact on a topic such as electricity derivatives, uh, because we we had the opportunity to discuss on forward markets, particularly the physical aspect of forward markets in our previous uh, discussion. Today, we're going to tune in a little bit more on the financial side of things. So there are many uh, simple but yet uh, important questions that we would uh, love for our speakers to address. Uh, firstly, uh, what sort of derivatives uh, do we need to bring into uh, the electricity uh, power ecosystem? And would these uh, electricity derivatives be purely financial in nature or also financial linked with physical delivery? How do we sort of uh, 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 understand the nuance and the differences between them? And then, of course, uh, how will each of these derivatives be settled uh, going forward? Uh, particularly, uh, uh, how, how would this pricing be pegged to uh, the spot market? And then which uh, segment of the spot market would the pricing aspect be pegged to? And how would that, uh, again, go with the settlement uh, after we reach the delivery time? That would be another interesting aspect to see because the, uh, the way electricity is different from other commodities is that it varies throughout the day. So how do we sort of um, you know, um, link it? And then, uh, of course, uh, then comes to the different types of derivatives that's available and how do we uh, sort of see, do we see futures more in the in smaller volumes and in the short term, or do we see a little more larger volumes of forward contracts or even uh, different innovative kind of swap contracts, such as contracts for differences, uh, which of these different uh, options on the menu do we sort of foresee uh, uh, sort of emerging in, in the Indian power ecosystem? So with some of these opening questions, I would like to uh, start inviting our speakers to present their different views. Uh, and to all the audience, if you have questions, do place them in the Q&A box. We will take it up towards the end of the discussions. And also the speakers are uh, uh, invited to engage with them directly also through the chat. If you already see, you can address that. So I would like to first off uh, welcome uh, Alejandro to take the floor and present to us on uh, why derivatives, the what, and again, by whom. Yes, the floor is all yours. Thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot Shweta. Uh, good, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the French School of Regulation for the invitation to participate in, in this event. Um, so let me start by the very simple questions on, on why we should be uh, thinking on using derivatives. Um, and we have to go really to the basics. Um, and beyond going into how they should be applied to the power sector, we simply should remind that derivatives are an instrument to handle risks. Uh, and with that perspective, I think we can understand that there are many risks that are handled in the power sector that have to be uh, uh, mitigated. And that's what these instruments are have been built in other jurisdictions. But something that is very important is these kind of risks um, are very specific to the power sector. And these kind of instruments, they have to be adapted to the uh, nature of the power sector. Um, this is something that in use, usually it uh, requires also um, a spot market to work. Uh, this is uh, an input for these kind of instruments to work. And this is great news. India has worked uh, very hard in building an uh, electricity spot market. And now it seems to be a, a, a good time to start taking the advantage of uh, many 
of these kind of fi financial instruments and, and the opportunities that they provide. So going back to the to the basics, okay, what are the kind of risks that we um, that, that we might want to to handle? So let me provide us a few examples. For instance, what happens when there is a PPA uh, and the generator and the opterky, they have to manage a risk. For instance, what happens when the plant is not available? Um, or this is something very relevant for the for the regulators. Uh, what happens if there is not enough capacity during uh, super peak hours? No, this is also one of the of the risks that we we want to handle from a social point of view. No, it's not only from the market participants' point of view, but from a from a whole uh, social perspective. Um, there is also other kind of risk that we need to handle in the in the power sector. Uh, for instance, uh, a utility that uh, has a, a, a risk that may need to buy electricity in the wholesale market, but actually uh, it get, gets certain obligations, but the, the price that ca it can be transferred to the consumers, is not, it might not be able to transfer directly no, or as fast as, as they would like to. No? It might be much more gradual if there is an increase in the prices. So there is a mismatch also uh, in in this kind of um, uh, of situations. Um, and another risk also that we face is uh, the utilities, they might, they might have uncertainty on what is the demand <clears throat> for uh, electricity in one, two or three years. And uh, in many systems, basically there's a utility taking uh, all of the risk of this, there is this demand risk. So there are many, many examples, and I have done really an effort to make clear that these are very uh, uh, idiosyncratic to the power sector. No? These are the kind of risks, these are the kind of questions that we are trying to, to figure out how to solve you know, the problems we are trying to solve in the power sector. So there are, there are good examples of financial instruments that have been crafted in order to fulfill the needs of the of the of the power sector. Uh, and, and going back in this on, on the examples I was I was setting, when I was saying, for instance, that there is a PPA and the generator and the off-taker, they have to manage the risk of what happens if the plant is not available. Well there are, there is an instrument which is uh, uh, called the, a call option, which is a financial instrument in the sense that there is a physical plant behind that contract, no? uh, but the settlement is financial. And that allows the plant to say, to handle their operations in an independent manner and to fulfill the contract buying from the electricity from the market, which brings a lot of efficiencies, by the way, and makes these kind of contracts much more, um, the enforcement of these contracts, it, it's uh, much easier. And this is what the World Bank uh, uses as a term they define that instead of a PPA, a synthetic PPA, you know, which has many, many advantages on the efficiency side. Um, for instance, there is other kind of instruments that have been created. You know, what happens if we want to be sure that there is a capacity during the super peak hours? Um, in France, for instance, there is um, a, an instrument which provides a capacity credit and there is a regulatory obligation for Every off-taker in the system, at the end of the of the year, they have to uh, show the relator that they have enough capacity to um, fulfill the peak demand. And it's the generators and the demand side response uh, resources who are awarded those credits. So there is in the in the power exchange uh, in Europe, there is one product for the French uh, uh, capacity credits, for instance. Um, so. This is a, another kind of instrument that has been uh, uh, created. There is also, uh, in, in the very specific problem for a utility that doesn't know uh, what is exactly the demand that is going to have in the this year, next year, or in two years in, in, uh, from now, there has been created a, a very nice uh, auction that I really like. This has been implemented in New Jersey, in which basically, what what is uh, auctioned? The bids are for one percentage for uh, of the peak demand. So the bidders 
often are generators who say, I'm going to fulfill one, two, three percent of the of the demand of the related uh, retailers in New Jersey. And then what this instrument makes is that it transfers the demand risk to the generators. No, it's not the utility anymore who's uh, going to get this, uh, the, the burden is shared with, uh, uh, with generators. And that way we, you are sure that you are not going to be over-contracted. And the generators, they do their numbers on how they want to do this. Maybe they want to keep some old plants uh, there in case if it is too high. Uh, they know they're going to have very cheap plants uh, at certain point, but they are the ones to handle the, the, uh, the risk. So I, um, I will stop here providing uh, this kind of uh, examples. I would just like to have like a, a couple of, um, of comments. In general, these kind of financial contracts, we have to separate the fact that uh, they are uh, in exchange, no? they might be traded in a power exchange from the fact that there is no physical plant behind. No? That's a completely different uh, uh, aspect. It can be, there can be a financial settlement of, of this kind of contracts. This has plenty of advantages, no? But for certain of these products, we want to make sure that there is a, a credible uh, generator behind, no? uh, for the capacity credit, for instance, no? uh, this example for certain. And this should be reflected in the guarantees. Of course, in, in, in very uh, sophisticated markets, there are participants that they can get fully virtual contracts, I would say, no? uh, um, without a, an asset behind. But in, in this case, there are regulations that make this very expensive because you you need to put a guarantee that you are able to fulfill. And these guarantees, they should be graduated depending. If you have a plant, it's not the same as if you don't have a plant, right? If you have a plant, it's much more likely that you will be able to deliver. If you don't have a plant, the risk is much larger. So the kind of guarantees that they, they need to be adjusted depending on, on who is the, the generator. And the, this is my last remark is, Overall, it is very important for us to remember that these financial uh, instruments are a tool, no? and these tools they can be used with a public policy perspective. No? And each of the examples I have taken, there are often things that are, uh, regulators and authorities are concerned about. No? What is the real, the, the peak demand? If capacity, there's going to be enough capacity, what is the price in the long term? All these kind of things are really interest, uh, of our, our interest. So all these instruments, they, what is uh, uh, good news is that they expand the tools that policymakers have uh, in order to achieve their policy objectives. And this is a very important uh, a question to remember. I will stop here. I would like to thank again uh, FSR for um, accommodating my participation. I'm afraid I need to apologize for leaving early. I won't be able to stay for the discussion, but I'm looking forward for the recording. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for joining us even during a crunchy day for you. Um, so with, with that, uh, we if you have any questions for Alejandro, do put them in the Q&A. We will take it up towards the end, and we'll also make sure we can answer some of it later. Uh, so moving on to the next speaker, we have Professor Ajay Pandey, who's going to Go back a little bit. Alejandro already drive deep into uh, what are the uh, nitty gritties when it's applied to the power sector. But let's take a step back and understand from Professor uh, what are the implications of introducing a, a new uh, to tool in the Indian power market. Well, thanks, Shweta. And I think I'll build on what Alejandro has already sort of spoken about. Um, essentially, the derivatives are a way in which you can manage different kind of risks. Uh, quantity, price, uh, availability, resource, uh, at least whether the resources are being utilized optimally or not. You can nudge all this uh, using derivatives. So, uh, maybe I would start off with a small PPT. I think I've already shared, if you can share with others. So just to sort of make sure that um, I cover basically whatever. Yeah, so we can skip this uh, first one. So. I think moving on to the context, I think all of you were here know, at least in Indian context, uh, the um, most of the currently the market is structured the way it is. Uh, it's based on uh, PPAs, which are physical in character, and of course, some bit of 
bilateral, short term, medium term contracts. We also have electricity markets which are offering day ahead, intraday, real time, and term ahead contract, but they account for very small part of the market for dispatch. Um, and I, I, again, you know that at ISTS level, uh, the India has already implemented SCED, which is Security Constraint Ignoring Dispatch. Uh, this uses contracted energy prices for dispatch. And the objective was to move towards market-based uh, economic dispatch, which has um, not yet been implemented, but hopefully it will be implemented. So, so this is the context where we are. And I think Alain Nahandro has already talked about, and I guess you must have been discussing that using physical contract, in fact, he started by saying is that what happened in case the plant is not available, having entered into a long term. I mean, then obviously uh, this is a physical issue. And if the plant is not available, it's not available. And uh, if you want, the counterparty can dispute or they might be default. So the recourse will be to enforcement. And this is not something which markets like. Markets would like essentially the mechanism to be available such that uh, the counterparties are assured of whatever they wanted without having to go through the legal side of the enforcement or any kind of dispute uh, mechanism. Uh, the second thing is that there is a lock-in when you have uh, these kind of bilateral contracts. Uh, and if you want to really offset, for example, if a utility buys in excess and thinks that now it doesn't require that much of power, it has to then offset by selling it to someone else or freeing the uh, generator to sell it to someone else. Now this creates basically a new set of uh, counterparty risk exposure. So these are the issues. And then of course, in long-term contract, if there is, um, uh, for example, if you fix the price, then there is a possibility of uh, default by the counterparties. If you don't, then the price risk remains has, uh, has to be hedged. So I basic issue is that there are known limitations of bilateral contracts. Uh, and market uh, market is always uh, considered a better, let's say, um, uh, a mechanism for uh, managing all the quantity and uh, uh, price risk as compared to uh, long-term contracts. Uh, they have their own advantages, but they have their own issues. Now, basically, derivatives, uh, you can think of like taking advantage of the, um, let's say, forward contracts or bilateral contracts and also taking advantage of the market. And we have, I think we can create, I think except for physical capacity, practically every other problem can be sorted out by creating suitable financial contracts in the context of energy. And it's just a left to imagination as to what is the problem you are likely to encounter. And you can solve it by actually creating a, a purely uh, financial contract. Some of them may require physical settlement. Some of them may require cash settlement. That's the only thing. But, uh, Except for physical capacity, let me repeat, everything can be solved by creating suitable contracts. And if you're talking about market-based sector, I guess that's the ideal, that you don't require too much of uh, intervention by either the legal side or the regulatory side. Let it be, uh, the regulators can only look at what the markets are doing, whether they are doing anything funny, which is not appropriate from the point of view of the public policy or public value, but otherwise the, they leave it to work based on the set of contracts which are already available to, for the players. That's basically the objective. We can move on to the next one. Now coming to, and you know that there are spe special characteristics of electricity sector itself. Electricity can't be stored in large quantities. So the prices uh, between spot prices and the link between futures and forward or any other derivative price is not driven by cost of carry. Uh, which is which is what happens in case of most of the other markets. So there is uh, also one additional advantage, if you if you will, that if you have the derivative derivative markets, then particularly futures and so on, they may actually end up discovering price. In so in addition to managing the risk, there is another uh, role which the uh, at least futures etc. can play in the electricity sector, which is to let the price discovery take place in advance. So people are really looking at as to uh, what kind of prices are expected based on the expected uh, demand and supply characteristics, which can be used for hedging, but it also is a good input for the players who are uh, active in the market as either producers or as consumers to start worrying about what they need to do in order to um, respond to those prices. So that's another thing. Can we move on? Now, coming to necessary condition, I think Alejandro has already talked about it. I think necessary condition would be basically 
that we need to have a clarity on the reference or spot market, uh, whether we want to do physical settlement or whether we want to do cash settlement. Uh, I think we need to have clarity on what is the market which will be the providing the basis for settlement. And um, this is currently, unfortunately, not yet reality, but um, uh, we don't have, for example, single market for dispatch even at the ISTS level. I mean, the uh, SCD is there, then the power exchanges are there, but they they don't discover really exactly one common price across all these uh, forums. Now, so uh, the point which I am listed is a good beginning would be uh, if you have a full fledged MBED, which is at at least at the SC, ISTS level, you have a single price and it has good liquidity um, at that level. Then second, of course, is that derivative, whichever is introduced should be actually fairly liquid. So that's useful for both the hedges. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you can't really have only hedges in, if you want to create liquidity, you have to allow others to also participate. Um, they may not do physical delivery, they may square off or they may, if you design it as cash settle contract, then they may get the opportunity to settle out on cash basis. But whatever be the case, but the necessary condition is, of course, to have good num good amount of liquidity in the derivative market. So it's not important that how many contracts are being introduced, but whichever contracts are there, at least people start using it. They have the confidence that they can be used for hedging or hedging either the price risk or the quantity risk uh, in order to sort of um, uh, to be useful to at least for the hedgers or for the end users. Okay, and uh, if you have other speculators coming in, it will also improve the price discovery, which is which was the last point. I mean, one need not worry about it that financialization of uh, some of the commodity market is viewed skeptically by saying that these are the people who are pure speculators. But one way of looking at it is, yes, they are coming in as a speculator, but they are also going to track uh, underlying factors which actually affect the market price. And they bring it out in the open. Now that itself has lots of value, I mean, for both the regulators and everybody else. And I think we should not shy away from recognizing that. If there is a, if there, this also acts as kind of informal, uh, uh, let's say, surveillance on the market players, because if I'm a speculator and if I get adversely affected because of uh, some uh, player who has actually the market power uh, to influence the uh, spot market, then obviously I will crib, I will uh, point it out. And so that's very useful. Okay, moving on, and of course, there's an Indian context, there's an issue about who regulates these uh, markets. I mean, and now we have an agreement between CRC and SEBI that they, this will be a joint thing, and I think uh, it should be joint because SEBI, to its credit, has already got experience of uh, keeping a surveillance on financial market, but it may not be familiar with the issues which are sector specific, such as economic or physical withholding, which can take place. And that requires information which is sector specific. And on the, on this comes, CRC has already got a, I think, division or a setup for market surveillance. So I think that uh, this needs to be done jointly. Uh, I think I would like to add um, that uh, we need to also, if we want to really promote uh, derivatives, we need to have clarity in terms of regulatory stance for power purchase cost. Currently, the you know the mechanism is that uh, whatever is uh, bought physically by the uh, discounts is allowed by the regulator as the price. If they were to use, for example, hedging, uh, what will be regulatory stance is not known. So the um, if they start using hedging, if the losses or gains on account of hedging, what will be the regulatory stance? Uh, as of now, it's not known. So you can't really expect them to participate unless that stance is known. Uh, now, of course, the regulators also need to then develop the capability whether the discounts are speculating or hedging which is also an open issue. But uh, nonetheless, it has to be done if you want really the derivatives to be uh, used by the uh, discounts. Of course, final point which I have in this presentation is that if you really want uh, full-fledged, uh, all possible sort of um, uh, contracts which can be created, I think eventually we have to move towards two things. The PPAs uh, have to get rid of their physical delivery obligation. They should be treated as financial contracts for energy prices. This is point number one. And we, on the regulatory side, we need to get rid of long-term, medium, and short-term open access in the transmission because then um, that itself acts as an impediment towards, for example, competing for dispatch. 
So, so these two factors, I think, will make the market more liquid if we go forward. Um, so I don't know how it's going to unfold all the things, but I think a good starting point, as I see, is uh, MBED. Um, right now, the focus is on market coupling, but instead, if it moves to MBED, I guess we will. Uh, that could be a good starting. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was a very comprehensive overview. You touched upon all sides of the aspects. I think, uh, I hope our uh, trading platforms uh, have quick reactions. So I'll give the floor first to uh, Ruchi. So if you can react as uh, MCX, because most likely that's where we will introduce these. Yeah. First, uh, thank you so much, Shweta, on behalf of FSR. And, uh, thank you so much for inviting me on this platform. And uh, listening to and sharing the views with the likes of Professor Pandey and Alexandro is really great. Thank you, Shweta, once again. I'll just share a PPT and give a quick view on that. So basically, uh, first of all, like the need for electricity derivatives in India, and as the earlier speakers, both the speakers have really highlighted, probably now is the time the spot markets have really developed and the short term market is growing at a CAGR of around 14%. The prerequisites for uh, any country to bring in the derivatives in any commodity and plus there is the share of exchanges. The spot exchanges are well developed. They started off around 2003 and now if we see the share is gradually increasing of the spot exchanges in the overall market and specifically in terms of the short term market it has gone as high as around 53 percent then the next point is basically the shift from long term ppas so as we have gradually been observing over last three years and the government is also regulatory norms are also pushing towards we are moving away from the practice of 25 years ppas to basically 12 to 15 years and gradually the moment will come wherein we really shift to a shorter, more shorter term tenure PPAs. And the increase in the number of participants across the value chain, if we see, yes, the consumer leg is one side, yes, but the Gencos and the Discom. So you, on the generating sides, we are seeing a lot of more renewable players. And we, as we move towards net zero and we the recent budget we have seen a lot of investment being proposed in setting up a, on the renewable side so a lot of value chain increase is also happening on the genco side of it so with this definitely the indian markets it's a right time probably for the indian markets to bring in a financial instrument from the point of view of risk management so that's the need of the r though the Physical side, yes, the delivery is happening through the PPAs and the spot exchanges, but there's no financial instrument either on the OTC or the exchange like right now. And uh, secondly, if we see what drives, why do we need risk management? So when the volatility in any commodity, this goes for any kind of a commodity, when the volatility in that commodity is very high, it arises the needs for derivatives. And if we see these are the numbers based on the short uh, spot exchange. So if we see an, an average, the average daily volatility, it's been an on increase year on year basis. And to have a volatile product as high as wherein average daily is around 10 or 15 percent plus, it really calls for the need for risk management. Now, in Indian context, we can also draw out some global overview, how the culmination of the spot and the derivatives have actually helped both the legs of it. So one side is the derivatives have helped the value chain to manage the risk. And now on the other side, we have seen different kind of products, new products have been introduced in the spot markets also, depending on the need. So they both complement each other in the development purpose. That's like European exchange, so EEX is definitely the largest exchange in that area. And if we see the growth, now they have German power futures, French, Italian. So if we see the 
percentage in percentage terms the growth of participation in derivatives which itself proves how these markets are growing and on the other hand the spot exchanges have introduced they have these are developed markets definitely but they have introduced as far as locational spread products also recently so that's the kind of development how derivatives and spot that's why i'm basically pointing it out because as all the other dignitaries present here will really understand where the regulators are also why this is getting delayed the regulatory approvals for the electricity derivatives this one perspective is also while will it uh, impact the spot markets in a negative sense but the global over with the global perspective if we take no it actually the spot and the derivatives complement each other both the markets and being in a commodity derivative exchange where we have all other products also trading so we have seen in other products also where the spot markets have really developed well based on the derivatives and derivatives obviously uh, prof ajay pandey ji really pointed out price signals derivative markets provide the price signals which are useful not only for the consumer side of it but for the generation capacities and understanding how much capacity growth is really needed and what will be the right price at that point in time so price discovery mechanism plus the risk management are the two needs of the hour for the indian participants and so this is of the europe and if we see the recent the japanese power exchange which tokom actually it was uh, the power contracts were launched in 2019 earlier they used to be on ex where this is really highlighting the kind of participation we are seeing so in japanese market within a span of 3 to 3 to 5 years itself we see of the top 40 corporates japanese electricity corporations 19 are participating on the platform itself on the derivatives platform so and besides others the count is increasing on year on year basis 2000 with the launch in 2019 starting off with just 13 participants they've gone as high as 143 so it involves all the even the foreign power traders have come on to their platforms and we have seen the mdcos of these ex as well as yeah, to come actually coming out and giving statements like their platforms are used more effectively by the hedges on year on year basis this is one just a site and touch base on an example for genco's if you see uh, these are the leading uh, gen genco's in uh, the power sector and in the european markets and if we see these are all the utility companies which are hedging in fact they have hedged for the future so i'm talking in terms of 2024 to 2026 still how much percentage they are actually hedged which is help them since they are the generator side this is help them to lock in prices in a range of euro 45 to 150 depending on the seasonal patterns and the different seasons while the historical average ranges between 20 to 50 and definitely this also helps them to filter into how much uh, renewable or non renewable and how much capacity they need to develop accordingly so that's a help if you uh, just one of these points if we see the below graph the lines are indicating the hedge prices logged in whereas the circles are indicating the average achieve prices so just see the variation so they are able to get a better price also because this this is from the genco's point of view from the average is they are able to achieve a better price obviously when they are achieving in suppose 2026 i foresee a better opportunity my investment flow in building the capacity also increases and we have seen europe in the war times how because of the lack of their own capacity they had the prices really went they were bizarre prices of the power sector of the power electricity in the european markets so so this this was just a context to set in how the need has arises and if i touch base there have been certain question on the regulatory front yes post the supreme court verdict joint working group has been formed between sebi and crc they have been jointly working on it they have been conducting meetings to understand how they can better bring out the electricity derivative products in the market and since 
we already have a spot market which is providing delivery what is pro being proposed for indian markets is a cash settle a financially settled contract basically for risk management purpose to start off with and from the participation side professor pandey has already highlighted any derivative market to create liquidity will need all sorts of players so besides value chain participants we will definitely have financial in institutions or financial investors also because one is going to build in the liquidity one is going to suck out the risk so that goes one is taking the risk one is giving you the risk so that goes without saying the regulators will definitely look into this aspect and bring out the best product which is suitable for the market and at mcx level also we have been engaging with the value chain across the be it uh, gencos or discoms or the trading licenses as well as end consumers the need from the market is definitely there the market itself is feeling the need to have a risk management instrument because take up any other like forex i'll just cite an example of foreign exchange usd inr is a main thing even if we see the average daily volatility over last 10 years it won't be anywhere more than 4 to 5% that's a very high range but still we do hedge that but here in we are talking about a volatility of 15% basis and we do not have any instrument in the country one we do not have any instrument within a country to manage the risk any financial instrument secondly electricity is a very very nationalized commodity so even if anybody wants like other commodities like crude oil or natural gas or other products bullion you can go abroad and hedge on the other exchanges or otc markets but for electricity besides ppas there is nothing else where you can really hedge because you can't hedge these products abroad in other exchanges so the need for the market is set and i'm sure regulatory on a positive side they are working towards it but probably uh, if the approval processes and all can be set in and the product can be brought it at the earliest possible for the market it will be a huge help for the market thank you thank you so much uh, prachi for uh, giving us a little bit of insight into how other derivative markets have been emerging um now probably i'll invite uh, mr rajesh to give us a little bit more peek into how from the indian side uh, the different stakeholders b2 utilities or gencos uh, how will it sort of impact them and what what are some of the measures that they can take should energy der electricity derivatives be introduced thank you shweta uh, so i represent ptc we are market makers we are traders so we occupy a unique perch in the sense that we uh, procure power from the sellers and then sell it to buyers so we have both perspectives but derivatives is a unique concept as the other speakers also said i can also express views in the market if everybody is going for risk hedging there has somebody has got to provide liquidity and that is the speculator and there is also the role for a market maker there now to put the context straight in the indian context people talk about reference prices and i heard uh, professor pandey also talk about mbed versus market coupling i have a slightly different view there today we have 86% of our contracts under long term pps so those are contracts which are essentially forward contracts 25 to 35 year contracts where the volume and the price is currently locked in so they are essentially long term forward contracts so somebody who is a participant there if we, they want to express a view in the short term market as prices fluctuate there is a unique behavior of market participants that we have observed that if in the interim there is a geopolitical tension and prices in the spot market fluctuate they want to renege on these contracts and then sell it in the spot market to make a killing now if there was a derivative segment in place you can express that view without getting out of the contract is actually a huge benefit there second if mbd has to be implemented that means a single market i can't have uh, three exchanges with three different segments all of them bifurcated into dam rtm gdam hp dam multiple segments multiple reference prices if i want to implement something like an mbd let it be a single market we also saw a slide on volatility in the uh, prices and the dam prices let me be very clear there is not a single dam mcb price when we say a dam price that is a price of 96 time blocks and if you were to trifurcate the volatility even into segments like solar hours non solar hours night hours you will find the volatility all over the place so in fact it makes an ideal if it was a financial market i would say somebody should be trading vaults 
instead of prices and volumes. But that's not the point. The point is that the volatility is so all over the place, just in terms of the hours uh, in which these prices flow. So if you ask from a trader's perspective, do we want an electricity derivatives market today? Yes. Unequivocally, I would say that yes. But we are only 100 terawatt hours in terms of exchange traded volumes. You saw the slides that uh, Ruchi showed, I think uh, 5,600, 8,000. We are nowhere there in terms of liquidity. And if you even observe the amount of liquidity that in the spot, the so-called spot market, which are again day head markets, they are not technically spot when I talk about DAM. Even there, five or six market participants influence the prices. So if that is the amount of liquidity that is there in the market, uh, then uh, of course the concern of the regulators is fair and warranted in terms of uh, market participants taking positions in both financial and spot markets to play the two markets together. Yes, we need derivatives. We need checks and balances. From a market maker's perspective, we definitely see a lot of value. We think there is a room for proprietary traders, including market makers like us. We provide the other side of the hedge. It provides an avenue for people to express short-term views, even if they are locked in uh, long-term contracts. And uh, I think the time is now opportune for the market to launch electricity derivatives, risk notwithstanding. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. Uh, you did bring in a little bit of the risk hedging versus speculation, why different positions are needed, and of course, made it very clear uh, in support of some of what was already flagged by the other speakers. Uh, before we get in a little bit more Q&A, let me bring in our last speaker, uh, Mr. Rohit Bajaj, from the IEX perspective as a power exchange platform. Uh, we have been discussing a lot about the spot market reference, so probably you could throw some light as to uh, how you see this uh, playing out in the Indian context, and um, uh, also what sort of products uh, within derivatives do you see uh, emerging first? Yeah, thank you, Shweta. Thank you, FSR, for giving me this opportunity. I'm audible. Thank you. Uh, so the. It is always a pleasure to be part of these discussions. And uh, today one is a really special one because this is something which we have been doing for a long, long time. We have been discussing this for so many years. Earlier there was uh, regulatory uncertainty, which has been clarified now. We have covered lots of ground and uh, still we do not see light at the end of the tunnel because we don't know when this would be uh, become a reality. So I just want to mention three points. First is, uh, let us evaluate where we are in terms of a prerequisites which are required for launch of electricity derivative. So ideally, we should have a basic infrastructure. Here, infrastructure means there should be energy market should be there in place. We should have a transmission framework or transmission infrastructure should be there in place, which we already have. There are concerns raised by some of the participants that market is not as liquid as we want it to be for the purpose of launching electricity derivative. But we have that spot market available. It has been working for almost 15 years now and we have seen a growing trend there. Second thing is we should have regulatory framework for delivery market we do have for derivatives. It can be evolved. It is also not a, uh, I would say, big deterrent. We can always create that. We should have diverse participant base. Here we have some concerns. When we say diverse participant base, then we talk about generators, we talk about utilities, we talk about open access consumer who should ideally be participating in the market. But last four or five years, what we have seen is there has been a major declining trend. Today, we have more than 7,000 participants registered with us, but on a given day, last two years particularly, the participation has reduced drastically because it is not making... Uh, many open access consumers are not participating because it is not viable for them. So what we have seen over the last two years is because of increased demand, the deficit situation has emerged and prices are going up like anything. In the peak hours, it is constantly hitting the cap, cap price. Uh, Ruchi has shared with us last two years, the volatility overall has increased. So these are certain things which are not good for a large participant base who are basically consumers who are coming to the market to take advantage of the market which is which is available. So unless we uh, promote open access or unless we have uh, good regulation, fair play regulations available for open access, I think for, we have to uh, really think 
about how uh, successful derivatives are going to be because uh, in the derivative, as we all know, it is used by the participants to risk their uh, to hedge their risk. Now, who are the affected parties here? Now, if I talk about buy side, there could be distribution company and there could be consumers. Distribution company, as we know, is their buy is only 5% coming in the market. 95% they are already hedged. And uh, Mr. Pandey made a very valid point that today regulatory framework or provisions are not there where these distribution company can participate in the market as a uh, hedging instrument and then get it passed through or they can there could be uh, gain or loss or whatever will happen. Well, that How that will be seen by the regulator, we don't know as yet. Now, the second thing what we are seeing here is for consumers, since full open access is not there in the country today, there are not many consumers who have untied up capacity. So they have natural hedge available. Those who are participating in exchange, they already have contract demand from the distribution company. When the prices are going up, they are moving away from the market and then taking uh, same power from the their own suppliers. So now we have to uh, see from the buyer point of view, who is the real buyer who is going to come here? There is a need, no doubt about it. Today, electricity is contributing to 50-60% also in certain cases. If we talk about metal, if it, uh, there are uh, so many electricity intensive units where consumption is so high, their input cost coming from electricity is very, very high. They need some ways and means how they can reduce it, how they can hedge it, how they can protect it in years to come. So since there is a natural hedge available for open access consumer, there is no provision available for regulatory for state utility to pass it on. I think we have to work on those areas so that when we are in a position to launch it, we should have some liquidity coming from the real hedgers. Speculators will definitely come. They are the market maker. We know that. And in fact, if we see global uh, European data particularly, uh, there is a very strong proportion, which is speculator. Almost eight, nine times of the real hedgers volume is, well, comes from the uh, speculators only. So we need that 10%, 20% real hedgers, those who are going to be participate. And we have to work on it because there is no real case available now who is going to be the participant there. We do have certain companies like uh, some big steel plants where they have open capacities, where they participate regularly in the market. Uh, where they are uh, risk prone, where they are taking a uh, uh, hit on the prices whenever these prices are high, but this number is very, very limited. So open access is one key thing which we have to do. Third is transparent price mechanism, discovery of prices, which is there. And fourth important thing is lot of data requirement. So when we uh, expect hedgers to come, when we expect people to take position in the market, we also have to feed a lot of data on the basis of which they can uh, they can take that position. So that is another area where we have to work. If you ask me what is the present demand, what is the demand recorded in the last time block in the country, we do not have that number available with us. So unless we make all these data available on real-time basis, I think it is going to be very difficult for anybody to come and participate in the market. Coming to the point where uh, 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 Mr. Pandey also mentioned that we need a deep market, probably that could be MBED, where there is a lot of depth in the market. And if you increase the depth of the market, then possibly there would be less volatility. Today, when we say that the November month price was 399, suddenly in the month of December, this increased to 5, 5 rupees 50 paisa, it is because the market size is very small. Sudden surge in demand, little bit surge in demand, we see prices going up. Suddenly, there is some correction in demand because of weather event. You see prices correcting in a very big way. So I think if you have de depth in the market, this will be taken care. The MBD could be one thing, or there could be many other things, like government has vision of increasing the depth of the market to 25%. Presently, it is only 5%. Tomorrow, probably, we can route renewable energy through this market, through CFD mechanism, which will also increase the depth of the market in a great in a great way, which has potential to increase the depth of the market in a great way. I think we have to work on those things. Presently also, there is a liquid market available. We can use this market for the purpose of launch of derivative, but a lot of work re is required to be done so that wherever we are seeing gaps, we should be able to fulfill this gap. Coming to the last point, which is requirement of single price. So I don't think there is any requirement of single price if we talk about derivatives. See, by definition of derivative, it 
takes reference of underlying asset. Now, underlying asset can be IEX day head market price. It can be IEX RTM price or PXI X price or Y price. It can be anything. So when we talk about other market, global market, there are trade happens in so many different markets and derivatives are settled on one index, which is most liquid. So it is the most liquid index or most liquid market, which uh, the reference has always been taken in the past. And I think that this system can continue in electricity also. And uh, I really do not see any reason for having a single price. One more thing I would add here is, in case of electricity, the price is discovered in different, different time frames. In long term, there is a price for 25 years. We know that there are so many, and all the uh, PPAs, they have a price. For medium term, in three year PPA, there is a price. Then we have short term bilateral contract, four, five, six, seven months, where you have a price. Then day head market has a price, RTM has a price, SCED has a price, and even DSM has a price. So there are so many prices which are coming and getting converged just before the real time block. When the, that time blocks come where supply is happening, it is converging into a one price. So when you already have hundreds and hundreds of prices available, just having one single price in day head market is not going to make any difference. Derivatives can survive on multiple prices and numerous examples are available word over where this is being done. Uh, that's it. I think I have covered all the points. Thank you. So much, Mr. Majaj. It was, I mean, uh, we went into some of the other questions that I intended to open up, uh, but we already see a lot of questions from the audience uh, and we are running quite short on time. So if, with the permission of the speakers, we'll try and extend it for a little five more minutes. Uh, also, if it's okay with the audience. Um, so I think we have one of the questions uh, from the audience, which is not yet addressed, but uh, Mr. Pandey and uh, Mr. Rajesh did uh, touch upon it, is on uh, transmission congestion. As of today, we don't yet see it, but as volumes and depth increases, we will see. But And so in, in that context, in the derivative markets, beside hedging for price, do we, or, or are we also looking at derivatives for transmission congestion? Uh, any, any of you can react. You can... See, one is, oh, sorry, uh, I think yeah. Rohit was saying. Um, see, transmission, Both. we are talking about installing 500 gigawatt by 2030. That's our uh, target. Before transmission congestion, a 10% variation in RE is like a 50 gigawatt impact on the system. So that variability, when we say in terms of RE, it is, transmission congestion is the second aspect for me. We have today implemented GNA, which says that this entire country is one copper plate and you can draw from anywhere. That's a confident regulation. So for us, and we are we have this uh, CA electricity plan to build transmission corridor, green corridors and everything. We will get there sooner, later. I don't know the timelines. But for me, the bigger issue is in terms of the transmission variability that exists at any given point in time. And which today also many generators face in terms of being asked to back down when there is a peak wind capacity that is being hit. So the financial markets, and I think a lot of these concepts that we are doing and discussing even in today's session, is a sort of hybridized concept. It's not pure, pure. We are talking about pure financially settled derivative contracts in the Indian context. So if I had to hedge against that kind of a risk when there is a transmission variability, I'm actually addressing my exposure, not just price, but price and volume put together. So that's the thing that we want to hedge through the financial derivatives contract, not just price or not just volume. And the single point being seen, I again want to reiterate this point. The comparison with external markets and Indian markets doesn't work. Our markets are very, very different. Our one state might be as big as an European Union. But in terms of the volume that gets traded in terms of derivatives abroad and in India here, it's radically different. Because as I said, even the what we call as a spot market, they trade only 100 terawatt hours. That's nothing compared to what is uh, traded uh, about. I think closest that you would get would be the Australian exchange. I think 300, 400 terawatt hours. Even there, the size is much, much bigger than ours. So th at least three or four times. So we need, when we launch a derivative contracts, because when we say derivative, it is to represent the market. If 5% of the spot market is the base price for a derivative contract. So, and if we are saying that people are going to hedge it or express the views on the market, that's a very, very narrow point of view. So if we have to look at it, we need some kind of a hybrid index if we have to launch a derivative contract. 
because exchanges not do don't just do the collective segment they also do a bilateral segment the term at market segment which is growing in prominence actually if, uh, for example if you look at the last 2 3 days if you are doing 170 180 odd uh, uh, mus on the dam market you are doing 90 odd mus in the dam market so it's not a small market by any sense so when we say index there are a lot of mechanics that is involved in terms of launching a derivatives contract and if you look at what the past speakers said they are all about futures so to your limited point about transmission constraint my thing is that what we should be hedging is exposures the price and the volume put together in terms of an exposure and transmission variability as big a concern as transmission congestion sorry rohit i uh, cut you short please no 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 you uh, you have already answered it so just one point i will say so here what we can do is to begin with it is going to be a national contract so we are not taking into consideration what sort of transmission condition between the different regions would be there so that is long long way down there we probably will reach there in few decades because if you are going up to that level for each of that region you have to generate ample liquidity and it is impossible you cannot see it happening at this point in time let us start with national contracts and as we progress then we will identify that probably there is one contract which is required for w1 region and then the transmission element will also come into play maybe i will add coming from the other side uh, which is that maybe the question is motivated by what is the reason why for example i mean the rajesh had already pointed out that the regulator suspect that eight nine players can uh, affect the dam prices no and if the objective is to increase the depth in the uh, reference prices whatever that market might be dam whatever uh, if that is the objective there this question might be relevant i mean in the sense that um, if you have less um, uh, transmission congestion you have more depth in that market whichever market you are talking about dam or what so from that perspective yes it's important to alleviate regulators concern though i think uh, as rajesh and rahul pointed out it doesn't really need to be worried about so much from the point of view of launching derivatives so it depends upon where the question is coming from if the question is coming from regulatory side yes but i think on that i would stretch um, i think if the regulators don't have confidence in dam i guess it's partly their own doing in other words uh, if they want to increase the depth uh, you have to move quickly to mbed you get the depth uh, you get rid of short term uh, medium term long term op open access you get more depth so if 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 you really are concerned about it you will see much less volatility in the dam market in case the all these dispatches are happening uh, uh, with all these restrictions gone so i think it's part, partly they have to realize that they are looking at the wrong uh, problem to start with uh, if they if they really want to sort it they can sort it actually thank you thank you so much for that quick reaction on the topics i'm going to club two questions so that uh, we we can uh, any of you can again react we have one question on how does a uh, cap uh, on the spot markets that we see affect the derivatives market uh, it's it's i think we have also had this discussion the forward markets uh, most of us uh, we do have a ceiling uh, so how do we really sort of break open that uh, and also another linked question with that is Uh, how does all of this link with the resource ac exercise that we have uh, started to do and uh, and yeah after that i will give you the last question so uh, i can take that uh, so basically price cap on the spot exchanges was again what we see was because of as highly pointed out regulator seeing a few players trying to manipulate the prices the price lock has come in but on one side like this may be taken as as a personal view not as a exchange view but on one side where we talk in to bring in more liquidity in any market and we ourselves based on the dam we stamp by itself has been a spot market uh, very uh, not very highly liquid with 5 6% of it and we are trying to split in the liquidity creating two price caps in so that is one concern where in regulator yes has brought in that price cap it in one context this is a little hindrance to the derivatives development of because derivatives by itself is also a price discovery mechanism for the future markets but on the other hand since in indian context it is already come in maybe down the line while the regulators really realize how why the need has really come in uh, it should not be a show stopper for launching of the derivatives because unless and until we really bring that product to the market 
the nuances will develop over a time. There will be different kind of products which will develop over time. Even uh, like European markets lately have introduced locational spreads kind of a thing. So different kind of products, but while we are not giving the participants at any product and creating every little hurdle, creating it to be a showstopper for the launch of it, it really uh, doesn't help to develop the market itself. The India being a third largest producer, consumer, electricity, we are, and we are moving forward towards looking forward to a trillion dollar economy. Such a lot of consumption is coming in. We are not trying to bring in a basic product. So where it can help is, as Professor Rajay Pandey also wanted, setting up a right surveillance mechanisms. This is from the experience of commodity derivatives in other commodities besides electricity, setting up the right surveillance mechanisms from the regulatory point of view and the checks and balances will really help to develop, but not thinking that every little thing, every new regulation coming in the spot becomes a showstopper for launching the derivatives. That will not go a long way in developing these markets. So my quick reaction on resource adequacy, I think, to the extent you have date, liquid dated the futures, it will help a little bit, but not beyond a point. As I said, I think resource adequacy is about having physical capacity, and that needs to be worried about separately. Um, and I don't think it will, uh, in fact, it should be looked at in more integrated manner than one currently is being looked at. I mean, that's my view, of course. Uh, I think further extending Ruchi's argument is again, price cap is the way to look at is that 95% is non-responsive to any demand or supply variation. Only 5% is supposed to do the adjustment, which is what you're talking about spot market. So obviously it will be much more volatile and therefore you get upset by looking at that number when it kind of shoots us at a certain level. You would not see that number in case the 100% was responding to the changes in the demand or supply. Then this problem would automatically go away. I mean, so again, it's a problem it is like self-created problem. And I think it has to be sorted out by recognizing that it's a self-created problem. A lot of points uh, here are focused also on regulatory governance mechanisms and uh, the process itself. So that's a to total uh, different debate to have one day, probably. And I agree with you, Professor. Capacity is a discussion for another topic as well. Uh, we probably will try and have a discussion on capacity markets uh, sometime soon. Uh, but Two quick questions from the uh, Discom perspective. Is there any thumb rule on how how much of the utilities portfolio can uh, be ideally be hedged? Uh, of course, uh, for Indian context, we don't have yet, but uh, internationally, what's the uh, norm, if, if at all? And then what would be the typical cost of hedging as a percentage of the actual cost of electricity uh, from international experiences, be it in Europe or Japan? I think, Ruchi, this is coming from uh, your slides. Yes. Uh, so firstly, taking on how much percentage of utilities should hedge. Um, I really don't have such that kind of a data availability in like what percentage even for the globally. But yes, as far as we have been connecting and reading through, uh, utilities in European markets do hedge on and do hedge on the platform. But what percentage is, and we really don't know from the global side of it. On the other end, the cost of hedging, uh, I electricity in exact electricity terms, I may not, but the cost of hedging any products in the derivative markets is not very high. I'll just cite an example to it because if we like we take a term insurance for us, so hedging from the point of view of considering it as a cost to the business is not a right criteria or a right cultural aspect because. If you take a term insurance, the premium you are paying is for the like your life, okay? For the but that's how hedging should be considered as a sustainability mechanism. If you really want to survive with the growing input costs on day and day basis, then you have to be competitive in the market, and that is a cost. One side is this. Secondly, cost of hedging overall basis in other products, it's a leverage derivative. is a very leverage product. Besides impacting your margining mechanisms, margins and initial margins anyways are there in dam market also on the spot. Similar kind of margins are in the derivative markets also. 
but they they also have cost effective products like options so futures and options combination of hedging strategies have really worked but in terms of exactly say if the price of cost in the dam market is 5.5 or something and how much will be the cost of hedging exact numbers are difficult to come out with can i sort of say add on this see the right way of looking at this is that if you're a regulator you would be asking this question whether the uh, utility is hedging or uh, speculating okay and basically what you would like to do is to check whether they are hedged overall exposure whatever through different exposures net exposure whether uh, it is in sync with their forecast in other words what is the forecasting error which you are willing to tolerate if the forecasting error is too much then you obviously either they are doing a poor job of forecasting or they are speculating you can't differentiate between the two so you have to really keep this under control uh, that you allow certain uh, range of uh, forecasting error but not any for example you can't say that i assume that my demand will be x and now it turned out to be 50% of x so the remaining i had hedged uh, assuming that the demand will be double that what it actually turned out to be then of course the regulator should point to object to that kind so that's the way i think we we'll look at this thank you professor maybe just to answer to uh, to the audience who had asked this question as well uh, europe after the price crisis in, in the last couple of years did bring in uh, cfds and uh, in fact uh, uh, compulsory price guarantees that need to be bought in from derivatives uh, i'm not sure of the exact percentage but a large chunk almost uh, 80% of the customer bases should have guaranteed prices that's that's sort of the norm that they were discussing Uh, of course uh, because of uh, abnormal prices that they experienced they had to go to these uh, 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 discussions but in india we're still far from there but already good to sort of um, uh, discuss yeah but uh, sir i think keep that in mind there it's a competitive market here it's this yes. uh, yeah. is uh, regulated yeah. business Ex exactly um correct so i think there's so many more nuances i would love to get into but we're running very short of time uh, we didn't get uh, much time to discuss on the different kinds of derivative products itself that could come uh, futures and options and swaps and uh, i think uh, also discuss the famous contract for differences that we see at least in european cases uh, i i know mr rajesh is smiling <laughs> so hopefully we'll come back to it uh, uh, in another discussion uh, so i would like to now invite uh, mr rp singh to make the closing uh, remarks and conclusions and Oh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Sudha. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, before I uh, give my closing remark, I'd like to comment on some of the statements which have been made here. You know, the power sector in our country uh, has to be not only seen from the mar market perspective, but it has to be seen from uh, various other perspective not only uh, legal but regulatory but financial as well as you know technical so uh, what we are talking here is in a part of compartment we are talking more mainly uh, related to the market dynamics of it but the prime mode prime motion of the whole power sector and the regulatory framework comes from the legal perspective and the legal perspective when i'm talking about the electricity act becomes the the key document and in the electricity act we have got uh, two sections one is section 62 which deals with the regulation and section 63 which deals with the market the market that the, anything which is discovered in market the regulator has to accept it it is discovered price and uh, the regulator cannot interfere it and what is under section 62 62 which is regulated the regulator decides that only so the regulator has got very limited uh, uh, domain on the market discovered price that is number one what we have been talking here so uh, and and someone was mentioning that the uh, how you allow the hedging of power purchase etc i think you were asking this this question uh you know the, the concept is it is not the price variation or the quantity variation there is a system of fppac that is fuel and power purchase cost adjustment uh, every uh, discom gives its annual tariff uh, requirement in which the quantity is, uh, is uh, given month wise that this much this month this much power will be required and how and what is going to be the source from where it is going to be procured and 
uh, what is going to be the cost of it. And each and everything is predetermined. That means the generators, their, their um, the cost of generation is known, the minute order dispatch is worked out on that. And say 5 or 10% is left, which is procured from the market. And market price, whatever comes, the regulator allows it. It does not uh, examine the speculative part of it or otherwise. And it goes as a PPC. That, that is, that is uh, I, I must clarify because I think uh, since I've been involved in dealing in these uh, intricacies, that's why I can share with you. So anything which it procures from the exchange is allowed in its static plan as cost pass through. And if uh, tomorrow or day after, some, in some days, say, even, even the derivatives are introduced, the regulations may be framed out. Normally, what we do is that there are two aspects of the tariff. One is the controllable, another is uncontrollable. So uncontrollable is always allowed as a pass-through. And uh, if it is controllable, then, uh, then there is a sharing of it. That part of it is shared with the beneficiary. So this is how the uh, uh, regulatory aspect is uh, dealt with. And why I was talking about the legal aspect, because the Supreme Court has clearly said in its 2023 order, December 2022 order, that you cannot have only one route till such time there is provision in the act. It is up to the discoms or the entity to decide what route they are going to take, whether they are going to take the regulated route or whether they are going to take the market route. So uh, uh, MBD or SCED, they only operate to a limited extent and it is very legally very difficult to have a retrospective impact on the legislative framework through a prospective executive order of NBED. So we have to think, uh, uh, obviously people are moving forward because uh, the central government wants it and everyone wants it. But till such time the act itself provides for that shift, perhaps it will be uh, carrying too much of legal risk in that. Now let me come back to my uh, main job of closing this. And uh, thank you all for such a nice and wonderful discussion today. And as we draw near this conclusion of this insightful webinar uh, uh, related to necessity of electric electricity market derivative, uh, we, we, we find that uh, it is very, very uh, interesting and necessary to have derivatives trading, speculating and hedging, uh, which are the inherent component of the derivative market to be taking place. While speculation involves taking position based on market expectations, uh, hedging aims to mitigate risk associated with the price fluctuation. Uh, balancing these components is crucial for market stability and risk management. Our uh, esteemed speakers have shed light on uh, the role of electricity derivative as a risk management tools uh, amidst the volatility inherent in the emerging electricity market. Mr. Alessandro, uh, his views on the global perspective, Mr. Pandey's profound insight from the academia, Madam Ruchi Shukla's uh, perspective from the commodity, commodity exchange, and uh, Mr. Rohit Bajaj's exposition on derivative from the power exchange and point of view, and Mr. Rajiv Cherial, I, I could hear my thoughts uh, coming out of uh, him. I, I really appreciate uh, having heard them and uh, enriching us our understanding on this subject. The discourse has underscored the pressing need for hedging instrument to mitigate price risk exposure for the market across the value chain. And it has hi also highlighted the challenges as measure the requisite for the seamless implementation within Indian uh, energy ecosystem. Our, our attention has also been uh, drawn towards the regulatory landscape and uh, the likely role of regulatory bodies like SEBI and CERC in governing the delivery and settlement of these contracts. Uh, as we con contemplate the key takeaways from today's deliberation, let us not only recognize the imperative for energy derivatives, but also embrace the collaborative efforts required. I, I conclude by extending my heartfelt gratitude to our distinguished speakers for their invaluable contribution. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Thank you. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, all the participants for an extended session.
Uh, up, up until next time.